Okay, so this talk is about protostars. We've covered a lot in the series on stars of uh, different types with a lot of talks about the end stage of the life cycle of stars with white dwarfs and neutron stars, black holes, quark stars and other exotic phenomena. Um, but I thought we'd go right back to the beginning because there's a stage in the existence of stars that's often overlooked. We uh, kind of skip over it. So the photograph here shows some very young stars. Uh, you can tell that they're young stars because they're often very hot blue, blue-white coloured stars. And uh, that's quite a, an interesting phase in its own right. And they've been formed out of the collapse of these large interstellar clouds of uh, dirt and dust. We call them molecular clouds. And they can be some of the coldest places in the universe. Uh, we often call them Bok globules as well, after a, uh, a Dutch astronomer who uh, catalogued them. So here's NGC 281 with some dark nebulae, Bok globules. Because the starlight uh, doesn't penetrate inside these globules very well, the dust and so on is very effective at blocking the transfer of light. They uh, can be about minus 250 degrees centigrade right in the center of the cloud. The heat from the starlight just doesn't make it into the center. Um, and that's good because if it was warm, then the material would find it very difficult to collapse under gravity. Heat is the enemy of uh, gravitational collapse. And so it's these cold clouds that uh, form into uh, the collapsing regions that create new stars. There's another dark nebula here. This is Barnard 68. I love this one. It's so dark you can't see any stars and it's against a myriad of stars in the Milky Way. So the rest of the field of view is full of uh, background stars. And round the edge of the nebula, you can make out what's going on in the thinner regions towards the edge of the cloud. One or two of those background stars are poking through, but right in the middle there, it's so thick that uh, even though this material is really quite dense, it's got the density of thin smoke, if uh, even in the most dense regions, really. Uh, but there are many light years of it that you're trying to look through and it's enough that the visible light can't penetrate. Now, sometimes we uh, use other wavelengths and particularly infrared light is very good for studying what's going on inside these clouds because it can penetrate through, is not uh, as easily scattered by the dust particles, these little tiny particles of almost smoke-like material. Um, here's a photograph of another star forming region. Absolutely awesome. This is uh, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And of course, the Hubble Space Telescope can pick up quite a lot of that infrared light, which makes taking these photographs of these relatively cold objects uh, really quite straightforward. They don't give out much light in the visible or uh, high energy parts of the spectrum. You really need to go to long wavelengths down into the red and beyond into the infrared to really see them. This is the Carina Nebula or part of the Carina Nebula and it's seven and a half thousand light years away in the next spiral arm. We live in the uh, a little suburb just off the Orion Spur which is a kind of half formed spiral arm. So the majority of uh, things like the Orion Nebula, which we'll see in this talk, are in that main Orion Spur. That's about 1500 light years from us. We're out in the suburbs. And then there's a gap and uh, the Perseus spiral arm is at uh, seven and a half thousand light years. And so a lot of the nebulae that we, we study are around about either 1500 or seven and a half thousand light years from us. And you've got one or two bright stars in the photograph and you can see how the gas 
round the edges of the denser dark brown regions looks to be boiling away and it really is that's the heat energy of these bright stars making the outer regions of these uh, cold nebulae boil off into space and the uh, stellar winds and their ultraviolet radiation coming from these uh, hot young stars erodes away at these uh, uh, amazing structures causing these sort of pillars where you see uh, one part is protecting the bits that are behind they're in its uh, in the shadow of the direction from which the starlight and stellar winds are coming from now here we have yet more wonderful uh, structures with a lot of these um, Bok globules again, the really dense regions, and this is uh, just characteristic of the regions in which these new stars form. Lots and lots of these photographs. Here's another one, Thackeray's globules taken again by Hubble. You can really see how dark and black and dense these uh, regions appear. Now once the star forming process sets off, then what we see are little tiny blobs um, which get the name Herbig Harrow objects because they've moved on from the Bok globule stage to a stage where a new star is beginning to form inside the denser parts of what was a very cold Bok globule and it's beginning to create a, a process of gravitational collapse and accretion of the material into a spiraling disk in the center uh, into a large dense blob that will become the star once the uh, star forming process has uh, completed and so these HH objects as they're known are the denser regions of these nebulae when they begin to collapse and there's quite a number of them marked out on this uh, lovely picture here um, which we'll take a little bit more of a look at can zoom in on some of them and you can see the light coming from the center of these where the proto stars are beginning to shine uh, in the middle of these uh, collapsing regions. Now the study of these really kicked off with a discovery in the constellation of Taurus and in particular Taurus contains this very lovely nebula the Taurus nebula it's about 450 light years away from us, so fairly close by. And there are some clumps embedded to the top left of the image is the uh, Linz 1544 pre-stellar core, a proto star that's going to turn into uh, a star at some point in uh, the fairly near future in astronomical terms. And in fact, uh, this was studied by William Herschel and he detected water vapor by its spectrum in the Taurus Nebula um, in and around the uh, caught this uh, collapsing pre-stellar core. And it's probably around 2000 times the amount of water in the, the uh, collapsing nebula uh, that there is in the whole of the Earth's oceans. So a tremendous amount of H2O in these uh, uh, regions. Now also in the Taurus Nebula is the archetypal star after which a whole class of uh, proto stars are named. It's T Tauri. Um, the uh, stars are named in order of their brightness by Greek letters and then when they run out of Greek letters they resort to ordinary um, letters from the normal alphabet and so this is uh, something like the 40th brightest star in uh, Taurus and it's a variable star which is what attracted people's attention to it and so there's a class of these variable stars called T Tauri variables usually around uh, 9th to 14th magnitude for this particular one um, so not a particularly bright star especially when it's during uh, at the uh, fainter end of its variability but that's quite a big uh, range, five magnitudes. 
each magnitude is a factor of two and a half, remember. So five magnitudes, a factor of a hundred difference in brightness. And uh, studies of uh, T. Tauri have revealed that it's just 10 million years old, so very, very young for a star. There are actually three stars present. Uh, spectroscopically, we can determine that there are two other components there inside this region called Burnham's Nebula as part of the Taurus Nebula complex. Also marked on the map with the green blob is the location of a bit of an astronomical mystery, Struve's Lost Nebula. It was catalogued as part of the NGC catalogue uh, that uh, John Herschel uh, Carolyn Herschel worked on and uh, it's not there anymore, it's vanished, the, the observational item has disappeared. So this may be part of the dynamics of the comings and goings and the collapse of uh, various regions within the whole of this uh, nebula complex. So there may have been something there that was uh, shining brightly and now it's uh, been obscured by uh, other material or something. We just don't know what's happened to Struve's Lost Nebula. There's another example of a T Tauri star. This one's uh, V1331 in the constellation of Cygnus, about 1800 light years away. And you can see the star bursting out of its cocoon, bursting out of the pre-stellar nebula. You can see the remains of the material and now that the star is, is shining brightly it is blowing away the remains of the uh, nebula from which it was born and this is one of the interesting factors about star formation that it's a, a self-limiting process once the star lights up the heat and uh, energy coming away from the star prevents that collapse. You remember I said that uh, the clouds need to be cold in order for the gravity to be able to pull them together. If they're hot then the molecules are whizzing around and have essentially escape velocity from the gravity well and so once you heat up the center the uh, material there just uh, boils away and so the star forming process switches off and this is why there's a maximum upper limit to the size of stars at around 100 solar masses because you just can't get enough material to fall in under gravity uh, quickly enough before the star gets so hot that it blows the rest of the material away. Now I've said that these young stars are often very hot indeed and because they're so hot they're often blue white in colour. This is another T Tauri star lighting up uh, the region of nebula that uh, it was born in and the blue light from the star is bouncing back to us reflecting off the gas. So uh, just reveals how hot they are. Now you'll probably remember that when we look at stars we often classify them on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So we have the brightness on the y-axis, the absolute luminosity. So the faintest stars are down at the bottom of the chart and the most powerful stars right up at the top. Um, and that correlates with their mass fairly well. But the x-axis along the bottom there is their color, which correlates exactly with their temperature. And we have the cool stars on the right and the hot stars, the blue stars on the left. And so most stars are on this diagonal line that runs from the red dwarfs at the bottom right up through the orange dwarfs, more massive. As mass increases, you get to yellow dwarfs like the sun there. And then the white stars and the blue white stars. And finally up to the blue supergiants right up at the top there. And if they're on that main sequence, that main diagonal band, then it's because they are in the process of converting light elements to heavy elements by nuclear fusion, usually hydrogen to helium, um, certainly only hydrogen to helium for the small stars, but the larger stars can start to uh, get 
hot enough and dense enough in the center of their uh, compressed cores to allow further fusion processes to happen. But once they uh, reach a certain point and run out of ordinary hydrogen to burn, that's when they migrate upwards and leftward, uh, sorry, rightwards into the giant and supergiant stages there. And uh, then they usually have a hydrogen burning shell over the outside of a core burning other materials in those regions. Now the T Tauri stars are not marked on this chart, uh, but I'll show you on a slightly less colorful version here where they exist. And it's a little bit complicated, but they're, they're pre-main sequence, these T Tauri stars. So they don't have the core temperature yet to trigger that hydrogen fusion process. That needs a temperature of 10 million degrees. They're still in the process of shrinking and contracting and the energy is being released from gravity rather than from fusion. And that makes them very, very different indeed. Instead of shining as a result of energy liberated from nuclear fusion, they are shining brightly, very brightly indeed, but from the energy from gravitational collapse, that potential energy released as things fall down a gravity well is enough to make them glow very, very bright and hot indeed. And um, indeed, Lord Kelvin was trying to figure out what powered stars back in the uh, late 1800s and didn't know anything about radioactivity or nuclear energy. And he couldn't understand what made stars burn for so long. He figured out that uh, if they were burning under normal chemistry, so the equivalent of burning coal in air, then a, a star like the sun would burn through its entire mass of fuel in only 5,000 years. Um, he then went on to look at what would happen from gravity and gravitational collapse down from a, 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 a disk the size of the solar system and worked out that would be enough to perhaps power the sun for 20 million years. And that's about right. That is about the age limit that you get for these uh, T Tauri stars. So on the diagram, we have the line representing the main sequence. I'll bring the mouse over. So here, this is the main sequence. And the T Tauri stars actually start up here. And depending on their mass, they fall onto the main sequence. So the very small ones that are going to become red dwarfs start up here and drop down to, to a uh, one tenth solar mass red dwarf, two tenths, four tenths. And then for complicated reasons to do with uh, what goes on in the middle of them, they uh, get a kink in their journey. So they'll fall down to this line here and then jink to the left and suddenly get hotter because if you go left on this diagram you're getting hotter for the same brightness the color is changing um, and the further up the graph you get the more pronounced these wiggles and kinks get through to them arriving at different places and you can see the, the timeline here so, um, so the larger ones collapse really quite quickly in only uh, 10,000 or 100,000 years the smaller ones might take uh, 100 million years to collapse from the earliest stage that we might call a protostar down to reach the main sequence. That's because gravity being much less is uh, just going to take longer to uh, bring everything together. So what's going on? Why, why at 0.6 solar masses and upwards do we get these weird kinks? Well, that uh, turns out to be from a process called lithium burning. I mentioned already that the normal process of nuclear fusion of hydrogen uh, requires a core temperature of 10 million Kelvin, 10, 10 million degrees. 
and that's usually only reached if you have uh, a stellar core of uh, 75 times the mass of Jupiter. So Jupiter, gas giant planet, nowhere near enough material to trigger off uh, any nuclear fusion. But at 75 times that mass, then you will achieve uh, a proper star, a hydrogen fusing star, and that's the smallest possible red dwarf. It corresponds to 0.7% uh, of the mass of the sun. And uh, there's an interesting intermediate stage that causes that kink at 60 times the mass of Jupiter. If you reach that mass with your, your nascent stellar core, then the temperature doesn't make it to 10 million degrees, but it does reach two and a half million. And at two and a half mega Kelvin, that is enough for the diagram shown on the right to kick into effect. And this is where what we'd start with is the normal protons, the hydrogen nuclei, the single positively charged particles, and they are able to combine with and fuse with um, isotopes of lithium, particularly lithium-6 here. Uh, if you take a proton and you stick it to lithium-6, you get a seven particle nucleus uh, with four protons and that makes it beryllium, so beryllium-7. Uh, beryllium-7 though can then capture an electron, spit out a neutrino and uh, the process turns a, a proton into a neutron. So you still end up with a, a mass seven nucleus, but you swap from having uh, four protons and three neutrons to having three protons and four neutrons, which makes it lithium-7. And so we've turned our lithium-6 into lithium-7 via beryllium. What you can then do is have the lithium-7 capture another proton in another fusion event, and that creates beryllium-8. Now beryllium-8 is highly unstable and falls apart in a fission event to create two helium-4 nuclei. And so what we've done is taken two protons and uh, a lithium nucleus and turned it into uh, some helium and released some energy along the way. And as a result of this, this burns through all the lithium content of these small stars, leaving almost none left. It's the first nuclear process that really uh, gets going inside these stars. In fact, that's not entirely true because you can get some uh, of the two particle hydrogen, the heavy hydrogen called deuterium, that can also undergo some reactions as well. And that only needs about 1 million degrees. And these are the, some of the processes that actually power the warming of brown dwarf stars that are in the range less than 75 Jupiter masses um, that are going to fail to become full blown stars. But it also happens in these proto stars during the first phase of their life. And it's why you have uh, that kink on the diagram. It suddenly causes a release of uh, energy once the temperature hits these uh, millions of degrees. So let's have another look at some really lovely photographs of this star forming regions. This is the Trifid Nebula, visible at this time of year, just uh, low in the south. And uh, this is a fantastic infrared picture from uh, the Spitzer Space Telescope. But we're going to zoom in on that uh, region that's marked with the uh, jigsaw piece there and have a look at some of the detail. And what we can see here is some of these HH objects, these uh, Herbig Harrow regions where new stars are being formed. There's some uh, new stars buried in the nebula here and some e e deeply buried ones just poking out of it and these uh, globules on the end here characteristic of uh, this type of nebula. But really look up here up top left We've got a little column here that's uh, resisting being boiled away by the uh, bright light of a star 
that's out of shot top left but this this is different this is a jet emerging so jet of material shooting out from the bright center just in here and this is uh, where a proto star has formed and has got an accretion disk uh, whirling around it of more material that's trying to fall in but is competing with the uh, thermal processes versus gravity to decide whether it shoots in or not and that uh, whirling mass ends up creating one of these uh, jets in fact there are probably one in each direction and we can only see one of them so here's a, some examples of some more jets the uh, green gas up in the top left picture is the accretion disk around the belt of it is the thickest part where there's lots of dust and right in the center where the arrow is pointing that's where the protostar is trying to form but along its spin axis a very highly collimated beam of hot material is being hurled back out um, along both the uh, north and south spin axis of this uh, rapidly rotating protostar You can see the same thing happening in the other diagrams in HH34. We've just got the protostar and the jet emerging. And you can see how it's a, a, an irregular, bursty process. Lumps of material get thrown out along the uh, line of the jet. And in the bottom photograph of HH47, the star is right in the middle, just here, not particularly bright but it's been pushing out these jets both ways with a slightly sinusoidal wobble to them because the spin axis and the magnetic axis of the star are not very well aligned. And so it hurls the material out along a corkscrew path and then it gradually loses energy until uh, it's uh, competing with pushing its way through all of the interstellar dust and material at the two ends and uh, gradually slows down and spreads out and forms these enormous lobes. There's usually quite a lot of radioactivity, um, radio waves coming from that region. So here we can see that uh, jet again emerging from the uh, donut-like region. Lovely edge-on view, but uh, if the animation will work, Here's an animated view of the uh, jet emerging. You see, you can see the irregular nature of the bursts of material coming out along the jet and then running out of uh, momentum as they hit the uh, diffuse interstellar gas roughly in the middle of the screen there. And the bursts arrive and cause that to light up, dumping their residual energy into it. It's a very uh, complicated process to describe, but the uh, conservation of angular momentum is involved in causing the uh, whole lot to spin up as the star and the protostar and the accretion disk forming around it contract inwards, very much like an ice skater pulling their arms in. The conservation of angular momentum increases the spin rate. And then because this is getting heated and turning into a plasma, you get electrical currents flowing. And where you have spinning electrical currents, you get a magnetic field at right angles. And that causes these uh, jets to form where the charged material gets spirals round the magnetic field that's being twisted into uh, these corkscrew patterns sticking out of the stars. And uh, the mathematics of, of this is called the crank model, uh, which refers to the crank of uh, winding the handle of a dynamo. Um, so quite complicated mathematics, but we're reasonably confident that uh, that's the mechanism that drives these jets. You can see just in this photograph how very highly collimated the beams can be. There's the protostar in the center here hiding behind this big cloud and a jet coming out this way 
until it dumps its momentum and loses uh, the speed and fans out into this uh, shock wave uh, where it meets the denser part of the nebula. But it's very, very tightly collimated to a nice tight beam coming out here. And presumably the same is going on in the opposite direction. And again, it's dumping the momentum into this shock wave at the back here. But a lovely photograph. And so roughly aligned with that, this is the sort of diagrammatic representation of these HH objects and their polar jets. You have the uh, protostar in the middle, materials being heated by falling in under gravity, turning its potential energy into kinetic energy, um, and then friction of uh, material whirling around heats both the star and the accretion disk up. Uh, material is then shot out along the, uh, the twisted uh, corkscrew magnetic fields, these helical magnetic fields that get created. Here's another example on the left of a, a protostar that's formed and the very tightly collimated disks, uh, not disks, jets coming out away from the centre. And again on the right, yet another example. And they've coloured this one red and blue because we can measure the Doppler effect and work out the angle of whether the uh, material is coming uh, towards us or away from us. So the blue material is on the side that's pointing slightly our way and the red material there is coloured red because it's got a, a Doppler shift indicating it's moving away from us. And it's uh, one of the things that a lot of people study in universities is how these jets form and how the uh, magnetic fields around the disc get uh, twisted and spun up into these very, very tightly collimated beams. It's lots of complicated uh, fluid dynamics and magnetohydrodynamics that uh, goes into supercomputers to simulate this to prove that uh, our theories and mathematics generate the same sort of answers that the, uh, we see in nature. So here's a couple of lovely examples of where we've got the uh, towers of remaining nebula that are still uh, dense enough to appear brown here. And at the tip of each of them is an HH object, a Quirito star spinning like crazy and putting out these jets. Um, and the jets are then creating these lovely bow shocks. You can zoom in a little bit more on that. So the protostar is hiding just here. This is part of the remaining nebula and this will be in the shadow of the accretion disk where it's not being blown away by the light and the uh, stellar winds coming from the star um, and so the material is able to survive in this location here. And here we have the jets with these blob-like emergencies and again, the shockwave both sides where the jets are brought to rest as the material hits the uh, rest of the nebula. Here's another one with a little tiny bit of animation to it. Hope you can see that okay. Um, so you can see the material moving out from the protostar. They really do make some of the most uh, beautiful objects uh, in, in all of astrophotography, but sometimes you can't see them at all. Here's an in example of an invisible jet where we can see the two lobes of the shock wave where the material is being dumped, but the uh, center part is obscured by dark dust that's uh, blocking our view of what's going on right in the center. We saw this one already, HH47, um, with the slightly more irregular disks that shows that helical structure caused by the misalignment as the star is processing and the uh, magnetic alignment of the magnetic field is not exactly in line with the spin axis. But just to give you some idea, the, these things are huge. They're 20 times the size of our solar system. So the protostar is influencing really quite a, a wide region, that little tiny bar on the bottom of the photograph there represents a thousand astronomical units. 
uh, an astronomical unit, the distance from the Earth to the Sun, 150 million kilometers, and out to Neptune, it's 30 astronomical units. Well, that bar is a thousand AU, and so these these structures, these jets, are flinging material out to tremendous distances. Here's HH47 again lying on its side um, and I've shown it this way round because we have another photograph coming up that's been taken not in visible light like this one where we've got the the uh, blues coming from oxygen and the uh, pinky colour coming from the classic hydrogen alpha 656.28 nanometer radiation that's uh, visible to our eyes. But here the Spitzer Space Telescope has had a look at it in infrared in the same alignment. And now we can see through more of that uh, uh, structure in the center there, right into the sort of butterfly shape emergent, uh, right next to the protostar in the middle. And you can even see quite a lot of the cold, dark, dusty material that uh, uh, is a much larger cloud than the visible object seems to suggest. But based on that photograph and uh, taking the spectrum of the material, we can figure out what uh, molecules we can find in there. Looking in the infrared is a very good way of being able to determine which molecules are which because the molecules bend and stretch at different uh, uh, frequencies and those frequencies correspond to the uh, energies of infrared light and so we can see the classic dip here from water at uh, six microns methyl alcohol slightly different so methanol little dip from the hydrogens of the methane of ch4 and then a big dip from silicates which is telling us that there's a lot of uh, rock basically a lot of uh, rocky material silicon dioxide silicon silicates with metals associated with them are a large component of uh, all forms of rock uh, then we've got some water ice turning up and this lovely peak here from carbon dioxide co2 in its frozen form so you can really see a lot of the interesting molecules that are present um, in these uh, molecular clouds and of course it's very important that they have those because planets are going to form out of the clouds as well as the protostars. Here's a, another image of um, HH47 that's been taken just in detail with a different wavelength and you can see these circular smoke rings that are being blown off down the jet. Absolutely lovely image I think. And so around these protostars, we also find the remains of the accretion disk, the leftover builder's rubble from building the star in the first place. Um, and we often refer to these as protoplanetary disks. So we have a protostar right in the center, shining by the power of gravity, remember, at this stage, not yet lit up by nuclear fusion but still pouring out lots of uh, energy. And these protoplanetary disks surrounding them are the material that's going to go on and coalesce in its own right to form planets. And we can see that in action here. We've got a simulation on the left and a real photograph on the right, almost showing these spiral arms forming inside the uh, uh, protoplanetary disks. So this is quite interesting because when we see star formation going on in these disks, we see the dense object in the center, we see these jets being thrown out along the axis, and we see a spiral arm structure. And you can relate that in your mind to the formation of galaxies where the central object is so massive, it's a, in fact a supermassive black hole, but that can often have these accretion disks with astrophysical jets throwing material clean out of the galaxy and of course the galaxy often has spiral arms during this stage as well so it's very much the same processes but in miniature going on 
around these protostars. Here's a lovely photograph of a protoplanetary disk, a protostar in the middle, lighting it up with the, the heat coming off the collapse process. And uh, say it almost looks like a tiny spiral galaxy. Now a lot of these we've had to map using very long wavelength uh, light indeed. Uh, and it's the ALMA uh, Atacama um, millimeter telescope. So it's, it's using wavelengths of a millimeter which are in the uh, microwave and radio, radio waves really, but they're very short uh, wavelength radio waves, uh, longer than infrared, but shorter than uh, normal microwaves. Your microwave oven has uh, wavelengths of 12 centimeters. This is uh, looking at wavelengths of a millimeter or so. And we've got quite a catalog of interesting uh, solar systems in the process of formation here, where the protostar is in the center and you're getting rings of material forming. And of course, those rings are going to result in the creation of planets at that orbital distance from the star. So uh, definitely seeing that solar system like structure starting to emerge. Now here we've got a, a nice wide field view of the Serpens Nebula. It's in the Orion uh, sort of distance of 1300 light years uh, category. So we get a great view of it because it's fairly nearby. But in the upper right of the image, there is a protostar with an accretion disk and it's uh, creating what they call the bat signal. Um, because the star is creating a shadow across the nebula, which is the shadow of the protoplanetary disk. Now it takes a little bit of getting your head around it, but is this star here that we're talking about? And can you see how there is a dark wedge both sides where the nebula is not being lit? So this is the shadow of the protoplanetary disk being projected outwards. And there's a second little one example over here where there's bits missing apparently in the nebula. So I'll just draw that in for you. So the, the accretion disk, the protoplanetary disk is casting these shadows uh, out. If we just go back, you can see actually it's creating almost a circular shadow on the uh, nebula up here. Very much uh, like Gotham City with Batman and the bat signal, hence the name. I'll just bring those back again so you can see where I'm talking about. And then actually if we go and look deep inside the heart of the uh, Orion Nebula, we find we can zoom in on some of these structures forming. So here we have a protostar right in the center of a fairly dark D dusty disk out of which it's forming and some other uh, blobs, the Bok globules that are going on to form new stars and new planetary systems and another one here where the collapse in the center is getting dense enough to create a new star. But one of the uh, processes that's very important in these proto stars, these T Tauri stars, is that in this early phase of their creation, I said that they uh, get very hot and they create tre tremendous solar winds blowing outwards. And these <coughs> stellar winds not only prevent the star growing anymore, but they have a huge influence on the nature and distribution of the leftover material that goes into forming the family of planets that uh, most likely evolve around the stars. What it does is it blows away an awful lot of the volatile material, the methane, water, ammonia, those sorts of uh, easily boiled materials um, from the inner regions and carries them out to the colder regions further out in the uh, proto solar system um, beyond what's called the snow line or the ice line where it gets cold enough far further away from the star 
to uh, form uh, back into solids. And there's a very interesting example of that in the Orion Nebula. This is a marvellous photograph of the Orion Nebula. And V883 Orionis is a T Tauri star um, just next to the, the main part of the Orion Nebula there. Um, and I, I think it might be this one here, there. The, uh, this, this is another T Tauri star associated with um, a Herbig Harrow object uh, with jets and all of the rest of it forming. And you, we can definitely see the disk having been blown away sufficiently well to see the process of uh, sorting of the material and the removal from the inner part of this new solar system of the volatile materials blowing them out beyond the, the uh, sight line. So in fact, here's, here's M42 and we're just down here, just a bit below it. So it's in this direction. I got a, not a photograph, but an artist's impression of what we've detected at uh, around V833. And that is this idea that you have the star in the center and then the rocky silicate material that's been detected spectroscopically um, and the metals are staying in the central region and all of the volatile material, the so-called ices like ammonia and water and carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, methane, all those small molecules that have a low, low boiling point have been blasted away from that inner solar system out into the outer regions beyond the snow line. And of course, that's very much the picture that we have in our solar system with the inner planets mostly being composed of the highly refractory dense materials, the rock and the metals, whereas the gas giants contain vast amounts of volatile uh, substances and uh, form in much larger sizes of planets further out beyond the snow line. And just to say that, of course, uh, one of the uh, factors that triggers this whole life cycle is that giant stars explode as supernovae, scatter their contents all over the cosmos, and it is then from these that eventually the uh, cold, dark nebulae form and condense and recycle themselves back to form these protostars these uh, hot regions that are not burning by nuclear fusion yet, but are nevertheless critical in determining exactly what the planetary environment around the young star will be um, when the star eventually finally lights up by nuclear fusion and uh, that blasts away all the remaining gas and leaves you with whatever planets have already formed. So most of that planet forming process goes on during the T Tauri stage. And that's why they're so important really to understanding uh, what's going on. So thank you very much for, for listening. Uh, for